Hello, and welcome to Girls Globe's Google Plus Hangout, Responding to Women's and Children's Health in Crisis Situations. My name is Diane Fender, and I'm the Vice President of Girls Globe. We are an online magazine, a global network, and an international advocacy organization raising awareness about the rights and health of women and girls around the world. Today we'll be discussing an important topic regarding addressing women's and children's health in disaster contexts and crisis situations. Uh, when a crisis and natural disaster occur, women and girls and children face increased risk to their safety. The war in Syria, the Ebola outbreak in Africa, and the recent earthquake in Nepal are all examples of major crises and natural disasters that are currently happening in our world today. Women and girls and children are at the forefront of these issues and the primary individuals who are affected. Uh, today you can join in live um, by tweeting your questions to GG Hangout and using the Google Plus Hangout comment box. So we definitely want you to participate and ask questions. Your questions will be taken live during this Hangout and will be asked of our panelists. Uh, we are joined by an amazing group of rep representatives from Save the Children, Women Lead Nepal, and the Edna Adan Hospital Foundation. Um, I would like these individuals to take a moment to introduce themselves, and Ruki, we'll start with you. Rukia, I think you are still muted. Sorry. Uh, my name is Rukia Dahir. I'm the founder and president of the Edna Adan Hospital Foundation based in Washington, D.C. The organization was based in honor of Edna Adan's uh, incredible work. She's the former first lady of Somalia, Somalia and former, former foreign minister of Somaliland. Um, Edna has done a, a remarkable job of uh, decreasing the maternal mortality rate in Somaliland so, uh, and training midwives. So in honor of that, we formed the foundation to eradicate, um, well, eradicate female genital mutilation, reduce maternal infant mortality in Somaliland. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Phil, we'll go to you. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Hi. So this is uh, Phil Carroll. I'm the director of media and communications for Save the Children. Um, we respond uh, to almost every uh, emergency around the world. We're in 120 countries. Um, my personal experience with emergencies uh, most recently was in Liberia. I was um, serving as the info and communications officer in our Monrovia office um, during the Ebola outbreak. Um, and I'm happy to share those experiences. I think this is an important topic, um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Giselle, go ahead. Hi, I'm Giselle. Um, I work for Women Lead Nepal, uh, which is a small leadership development organization for young women in Nepal. I usually um, do fundraising communications, but since the recent earthquake, I've been uh, coordinating all of their immediate and long-term uh, relief efforts. Great. Emma? Hi, my name is Emma Salavanta. I'm the communications director for Girls Globe, and I'll be taking your questions from Twitter and from the chat function here on the Google Hangout. So remember to tweet us all your questions and send us your questions, and we'll make sure to get to those during the Hangout. Great. Thank you so much for um, those great introductions. Uh, as Emma said, we just want to encourage you to follow along live using uh, the hashtag GGHangout. Uh, and I want to start with uh, a first question to our panelists um, talking about when a crisis occurs or a natural disaster happens, uh, we know that women and children are most at risk. So what are some key priorities to consider in addressing health concerns. Uh, we can start with Rukia. Uh, 
Yes, hi there. Um, the crisis uh, that basically what I'm going to be focused on in my discussion is the post-Civil War in Somaliland. Um, the infrastructure in, in, in Somaliland has been totally destroyed, especially in the area of health care services. Um, everything that has happened since then has been done in a grassroots level, uh, locally oriented, um, and it's been a, a great deal of support uh, from the outside community, the diaspora as well, um, in building, um, for example, the Edna Adden Maternity Hospital in Somaliland, which provides uh, prenatal, postnatal care. Sorry, you were muted, um, Diane. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to to ask Giselle the same question. Um, what what are some primary health concerns to um, consider in addressing uh, women's and girls' health in Nepal? Giselle, I think you're muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, I can tell you that what we first responded to as far as health with our young girls in Kathmandu Valley was providing um, sanitary napkins for them. That was huge. Every time we got a hold of any of our current participants or alumni, that was one of the first things that they requested as far as like immediate relief supplies. So that was really big for us and one of the things that I think bigger organizations were um, maybe overlooking at the time or weren't necessarily focusing on specifically in Kathmandu Valley for the girls. So that was really big um, as far as a health issue for us and that we were able to respond to. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much, Giselle, for, for sharing that. Um, Phil, I'm wondering if you want to chime in on this question. What, what do you think are key priorities to consider in addressing health concerns? Yeah, so I can speak to what happened uh, in the Ebola crisis. So, um, as you probably all know, a lot of children were orphaned uh, by the disease, so their parents died from Ebola. and um, Sometimes if they were lucky, they got taken in by relatives or by neighbors. Um, there were a lot of times, though, that they uh, had to fend for themselves. And so oftentimes in a crisis, and this can happen domestically or abroad, um, children's unique needs are overlooked. So Save the Children does a great job in terms of um, promoting child protection and child safeguarding. Um, in the Ebola response, we're also very uh, focused on child reunification. So we set up um, safe houses, if, if you will, for ch children. So these were temporary um, places where children could, could come and be safe. And we would look for um, family members uh, or, or neighbors that um, could look after those children. So um, those efforts are still ongoing, as you can imagine. Uh, while Liberia was declared Ebola-free not long ago, um, Guinea and Sierra Leone, the, the two other countries that were hardest hit by the Ebola disaster, um, are still struggling with getting to zero. So um, one of the things that I want people to take away from this conversation is that the Ebola uh, outbreak is not over, even though it's it's no longer uh, on the front pages of, of the newspapers. We still have to be vigilant um, and make sure that, that children um, and their families are uh, taken care of um, until, we, until we reach zero. Thank you. Phil, and I th thank you, Phil. I think you bring up a really good point, and that is um, when a crisis or a disaster hits, uh, a lot of times the first instinct of people is just survival mode, finding people, finding family, finding friends, um, having some connection to get help. And I think uh, a huge role in this can be played by health workers and health professionals um, and uh, and midwives. What do you um, what do you see as 
their role in responding to crisis situations um, versus just responding in to the normal medical needs of women and children. How can how can healthcare workers be empowered to address medical needs in crisis situations? And and how do you see that has happened specifically uh, in the case of the Ebola outbreak? Yeah, I think the the Ebola outbreak really underscores the the need for health workers. So what we found was there weren't uh, there wasn't a lot of trust. So when um, when you know Western um, doctors and nurses came over um, to help with with the outbreak, which is very noble, um, reaching those people in in some of those communities was was very difficult. So we really had to rely on on local staff. So local staff already had the built-in trust of um, of their communities and could go in. And, and sort of dispel some of those myths. I mean, if you recall, fear was such a big factor in getting people to um, hospitals and other facilities to be treated for Ebola. Um, a lot of people actually thought that Ebola was brought in um, from those people that were coming from the West to help. Um, so we really did need um, that local support. Um, a lot of our staff on the ground um, were Liberian nationals. Um, we we could not have done uh, what we were able to do with that without their support. And um, and I think a lot of the credit, while the international NGOs um, and the the international health community should be um, should be lauded for their work, I think we also need to remember that the only reason that Liberia was declared Ebola free is because of Liberians themselves. Mm. So I think that's such a great, um, first of all, that's really exciting. I think we should all um, be excited and thrilled about that. But also um, a key component of this conversation today is really local response and empowering uh, those at the grassroots level in their response to crisis and disasters. And, and Rukia, I know that um, Somaliland has faced uh, a variety of crises throughout the years and maternal mortality rates uh, are very high and so I wonder if you can speak to um, the situation in Somaliland and um, how midwives and health workers have been empowered um, there through that. Somaliland ranks um, as the worst place in the world to be a mother, according actually to um, the State of the Mid uh, Midwifery Report. Uh, Somaliland has been facing um, high rates of maternal and infant mortality, and it's predicted, it's stated it's 1 in 12 ratio, 1 in 8, you know, uh, we're, we're the highest. And the best way, short-term way to to fight that, uh, that challenge is to train midwives and, and, and deploy them um, throughout the region of Somaliland. And, and we found that as a quick solution than um, currently if training doctors, for example. Uh, the means and the resources are very difficult to just go ahead and do that. So the midwives um, go out to the rural areas and provide the, the necessary care, um, and they provide counseling and education, so we get the benefit of having um, them educate uh, mothers and families about the dangers of FGM as well. So um, there are the voices for women in, in Somalia and young girls and a great example which offers them a form of empowerment. Wow, Ruki, that's uh, so inspiring and so encouraging to hear how midwives are responding to um, health situations among women in Somaliland. Really encouraging to hear. Um, Giselle, I wonder if you can speak also to, have you seen, I mean, you were at the onset in the crisis with the earthquake in Nepal. Have you seen healthcare workers responding um, to the situation? And if so, um, if you can speak to, some, speak to that.
Giselle, are you there? It looks like Giselle might be having some technical difficulties. Um, so we can just um, move on. I'm wondering, uh, Emma, is there um, questions that we can incorporate from the audience at this point? Yes, we do actually related to what Phil was talking about particularly. There's a question about uh, what is the link between maternal health and Ebola. So how does the Ebola situation probably make the maternal health situation even worse in those countries? And what are the... Okay, so Phil, um, it looks like the question is how are, how is the Ebola crisis and maternal health uh, linked together? And if you can speak to that um, from your experience. Yeah, I think, I think the two are very inextricably linked. So what we were seeing <clears throat> when the Ebola epidemic was at its height was that mothers who were pregnant and were going to hospital um, were being turned away. Um, either because of fear or because um, there just wasn't the capacity. I mean, if you can just picture what it was like, I mean, hospitals were completely overrun with patients um, in the late summer and early fall. Um, but then also there was there was a fear of, um, you know, either spreading the disease further. Um, people weren't sure if uh, the pregnant mother that would come to the hospital had Ebola and would therefore infect other patients who maybe didn't have it. Um, so suffice it to say, uh, women were not giving birth in facilities. So we all know, those of us who work in this sector, know that that is not going to lead to better maternal or child health outcomes. And so um, maternal mortality rates we're, um, we're going up. I mean, I think the, the data is still out. I think we still need to, to kind of parse that data. But um, anecdotally, I think we can say that the Ebola epidemic did not do anything great for maternal mortality rates in a country that already had pretty abysmal maternal mortality rates. So, um, you know, and also women who were pregnant were afraid to go to hospital. So they were giving birth either by themselves or with someone that wasn't skilled. And again, we all know that if you are not giving, uh, if you're not giving birth with uh, a midwife or someone trained, so a skilled birth attendant um, who may have a little less training than a midwife but is still able to deliver, um, then if a woman starts to to go into, uh, it starts to bleed heavily, uh, that that's not going to end up well for for herself or her her child. So. Um, the Ebola epidemic definitely showed us that um, we need a better way to to deal with emergencies um, for for the stuff that doesn't have to do with with the emergencies. So um, when a child has pneumonia or malaria or diarrhea, things that kill children under the age of five in the developing world, how do we make sure that those children are still treated even in the midst of an emergency? Emergency. Um, we did uh, fortunately see uh, facility uh, rates go up. So people that were coming to uh, primary health care facilities um, once the Ebola epidemic was was slowing down in Liberia, those rates were going up again, which was which was very encouraging. Um, but talking to doctors um, at those facilities when I was there, they said, "Yeah, I mean, it was it was months before um, women decided to come back to facilities. So the fear was definitely one of those driving forces keeping people away, um, which was not helping uh, those outcomes." Great, thanks so much for that very thorough response, Bill. And then we have another question from. Um, change, which is, what is the role of donor nations in preventing and responding to gender-based violence as part of humanitarian response? And I think this is something that all of you probably can talk to. So basically, what do donor nations need to do, and what can they do, specifically in terms of preventing gender-based violence in crisis? In crisis? You can maybe um, direct that first to Rakia. 
Rukia, you, you, I think you're muted. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, Rookie, I think you're still muted, actually. Sorry, I think I didn't tap it right. Um, I think, I think the Donor Base Nation, a lot of it has to do with education, um, um, reaching, reaching out to um, communities effectively. Grassroots level is always important. I think the uh, resources has to be set and dealt with in a correct manner. I think that it's basically working with the local community involving men, women, Young, young women, young men in the discussion is, is very important and, and that's what a uh, country like Somaliland has, has been slowly but surely opening more to in terms of discussion with, with in regards to female genital mutilation. More young men are, are, are talking uh, and speaking out. I, I think that would be a good example. Great, thank you. Um, Phil, do you want to also speak to that question? I'm not a, a, a GBV expert, um, but I will say that, that donor governments do have a, a huge role in, in emergencies. I think, um, you know, we, we definitely saw this uh, with Nepal. I think the, the world kind of came around, um, was very touched by what happened, and um, and a lot of a lot of great work has has already been done. Obviously, we have a lot more to do. But you know, in Nepal specifically, just in terms of it, well, it's not it, it might not be a gender-based violence issue. We are seeing an increase in in female trafficking. So um, one of the things uh, that Nepal, you know, it's it's kind of on that uh, border between India uh, and China, and so. Um, you could imagine when a, when a, an emergency like a, a, an earthquake of that size hits, um, things are very chaotic. And um, and again, anecdotally, we've we've been seeing an uptick in in trafficking. So um, just to to keep that in mind, that this is another thing that when uh, the first responders come in and they're dealing with the immediate needs, so the medical needs and and getting people into shelters and getting people food and the things that obviously will keep them alive. Um, there are some nefarious forces at work, and they're going to take advantage of, of the chaotic situation. So just um, making sure that, uh, that again, that those other needs that can so often be neglected um, are, are kept front and center um, in an emergency. Phil, so I think that's, um, that's a really great point, and both of you um, spoke to that question um, very well. I think keeping... Uh, the needs of those that uh, we're trying to serve at the forefront, especially women, children, women and children, is really s crucial and key to this conversation. Um, I I want to ask you all, what are some of the challenges that you've seen? Um, to I know we've kind of talked a little bit about this, um, and and you've spoken to this a little bit, but what are some of the main challenges you see to addressing women and children's health? in crisis or post-disaster contexts, and um, what are some opportunities? Maybe what is what is the way forward? Um, Ruki, if, if we can start with you. Yes, I would start backwards. I'm going to say um, the opportunities actually from a post-war conflict uh, crisis would be the training midwifery program. Um, that's a great opportunity to hone in and to meet the short-term and long-term needs um, in, in rebuilding the uh, country's healthcare system. Um, Edna Adhan is also doing incredible work in increasing public health professionals throughout the region. So more anesthesia, uh, anesthesiologists, uh, we're getting anesthesists and um, I would say surgeons, two uh, female surgeons in Somaliland. Um, who are working in the hospital. Uh, they were trained as nurses, midwives, in that program that they, um, over the years over the years, doctors. And I think uh, that's a major movement going on right now. It's giving women, young women, and, um, and everyone in, in the country that, that motivation to know that you can become a doctor with will and determination. Um, so that's an opportunity that came out, which was post-war, um, didn't happen before it. Uh, the, the, that, uh, the actual things that actually came out of the post-war right now is that we're noticing an uptick in 
diabetes, diabetes um, uh, high diabetes, high right, diabetes, cardiac, uh, 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 um, a lot of heart lot disease. Of heart disease. So I just think so that think right now it's the lifestyle. It's a lot of them were livestock, livestock, camel herders, herders uh, sheep herders, and they moved during the war for short-term placement, placement, more in the urban, areas. Urban, areas. urban areas, and they're now, um, you know, their, their lifestyle has changed. So I think there's, uh, as a result, there's increase in, in, in health uh, problems from that. So that's one thing I noticed. Wow, thank you so much uh, for sharing that um, inspiring story. I think seeing the opportunities and um, the amazing opportunities for young women to become doctors and really work and serve of the people in their community is really inspiring and also I think helps with the challenges because more um, health care professionals and midwives are being trained to address um, local local issues in Somali land, which is really encouraging. Um, Phil, I'm wondering if you can share some of the challenges that you've seen and, and what are the opportunities? Yeah, I think the challenges, I, I think I addressed part of this in, in my last response, but uh, the challenge is when you have a, a health system that's completely um, overwhelmed. So the Ebola crisis, I mean, there was, uh, it was hard to just do anything except treat Ebola patients at the height. I mean, um, Ebola treatment units and community care centers, those were the two main places where people were going to get treated. There weren't enough beds at times, so people were actually being turned away. Um, people were dying in the streets. Um, so you can imagine with uh, the health indicators of these three countries are some of the worst in the world. Uh, this was before Ebola. The fact that when Ebola hit, uh, that common common illnesses, so I mentioned three, the, the three biggest killers for children under the age five, diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria. Um, were being not for um, uh, were being neglected not because doctors and nurses and and those people were were not um, concerned about them but they just did not have the capacity to deal with with those very treatable illnesses so that's that's a real shame um, and I think one of the one of the solutions is and this is something that save the children and others have been calling for is we need to uh, strengthen health systems, not only in, in the three countries uh, that were hit by Ebola in this outbreak, because Ebola, this wasn't the first time that Ebola has been seen. It's been seen for decades. Um, but strengthen those health systems in even poorer countries. So there are countries that uh, are susceptible to Ebola or an Ebola-S disease um, down the line. And so if we don't have the, not only the, um, the human resource capacity, but just the surveillance capacity. So all the things that go into a functioning health system, if we don't have these things in place, and I think the WHO, um, definitely Doctors Without Borders has said this, um, if we don't have these things in place, this is not gonna be the last time that we see Ebola or something even worse. So I think uh, while we, we seem to be having this disease under control, we definitely need to stay vigilant. This is not going to be the last time we see Ebola. This is not going to be the last time we see something uh, of, of that of this scope. So right now, in this kind of lull period, we need to start strengthening those health systems, which is not something that you know donors are necessarily interested in. It's not um, it's not uh, something that is seen on CNN, but it's something uh, I think even more important. Um, we need to make sure that um, just like in in the U.S. and Europe and uh, some of the richer countries in the world, they're able to to withstand disasters like this. I mean, you saw uh, the one case of Ebola that came to the U.S. Um, you know, people were in a panic, but but the disease did not spread, and that goes to show you that it's because of we have a functioning health system in this country. Um, others are not that lucky. So I think that's one of the the key lessons that I'm definitely um, preaching. And I think it's something that we need to take to um, to the international health leaders. Um, there was uh, discussion at the World Health Assembly in May about this. Um, we need to keep that that drumbeat going moving forward. Thanks so much, Phil. I think um, you've really uh, honed in on the key point for women and children in crisis situations, and that's that we really need to come alongside and strengthen 
um, not only healthcare workers but also um, systems that are in place to really serve people effectively. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Emma to ask a few more questions from those participating online. Great, thanks so much. So we have a couple of questions through Twitter. Um, I'll start with this one that will be um, if you're able to answer it, it's not answering a region or an area where you work, but um, there's a question about the immigrants that are all over the Mediterranean right now to Europe, um, um, Eritrea and Libya. And the question was what we as um, Western countries and donor countries do to, I guess, number one, prevent that? What needs to be done in those countries? Make sure that people are not in a situation where they really like they're forced, they're forced to take such a dangerous, dangerous journey across the ocean where a lot of them also die. Um, and then what should be done as the women and children in those receiving countries when they do cross the ocean, um, you know, fleeing from conflict or disaster or crisis. And um, I know that it's not necessarily your area of expertise, but if you have any thoughts on this, Sean, that would be great. So if uh, you want to go first on that question. Yeah, so we are responding to the migrant crisis. Um, and as, as the person that posed that question um, accurately noted, so a lot of people are coming from conflict areas um, from the Middle East and in Africa and are making uh, a perilous journey across the Mediterranean, usually to Sicily, but also other places like Greece. And um, and a lot of them don't make it. I think I think right now we're we're working with um, the European Union to make sure that there are more boats um, that are monitoring the the Mediterranean, making sure that um, people are rescued. Um, but once they do get to to land, I mean, it's not the the end of their journey is uh, isn't over. I mean, it's it's it, in a way just beginning. Um, they are in a new country. Uh, many times they don't speak the language. Um, I know that from colleagues who were at the port in Lampedusa in Sicily, a lot of um, women were coming over, they were pregnant. Um, what happens when they give birth um, in another country? Um, so this is something that we're dealing with right now and, and it's happening um, It's happening in Europe, it's happening in Asia. Um, so, you know, and, it's, and a lot of countries are, are not exactly um, embracing um, this influx in, in immigrants. Um, so how do we make sure that uh, once these people do come over, they've risked their lives, they've risked their families' lives for the hope of a better life, how do we make sure that they, um, that they get to countries that will accept them, that they can get jobs, um, that those children, are, again, are, are, are not um, taken from their families? I mean, these are all big questions, and I think uh, political leaders are dealing with these with these issues um, every day right now. I mean, it, again, I don't think this crisis is, is going to go away anytime soon. I mean, everyone can imagine um, the want for a better life if you're if you're living um, under constant fear in your home country um, and you hear from relatives and friends that there's uh, a better place out there. I think, you know, it's part of the American experience and I think this is what's happening right now in Africa and the Middle East. Um, so I think we have to be supportive and, and we have to do everything that we can to make sure that once they do arrive that they, um, you know, that they, that they are, are, are given some sense of respect and, and hopefully livelihood and, and can prosper in, in, in various European countries, not just Italy. A lot of people will come to Italy and then migrate north um, for better opportunities or where their families and friends already have relocated. So. Um, we just have to make sure that we're doing everything that we can um, when we meet them at these ports that you know that their that their needs are, are being met and that they that they go on and, and can live the life that um, that every human being deserves. Great, thanks so much for that response, Bill. And then I have another question that's specifically for um, Rukia about the situation in Somaliland, about how the crisis in Somaliland affected the situation of things like gender-based violence and health issues like female gender mutilation, and what was the result of the crisis for these kinds of... Um, well, okay, sure. Um, well, UNFPA predict, I mean, states that one in five women are pregnant during a crisis situation, if I'm not wrong. And I think that says, that tells you a lot about the importance of having, um, of having, a, you know, support from healthcare workers training them and making sure that they're skilled uh, and able to to go out and, and carry the work that a, 
a, a tra you know a traditional birth attendant would would do or eight year old would do. So I think that that is a major component to it. But also um, in terms of the FGM situation, as you know, 97, 98 percent of uh, Somali women undergo FGM. Um, and the largest uh, stage would be, uh, the, the largest amount of, would be, I would say, 99% do state, uh, type 3, the pharaonic, um, which is a total removal. And I, and I think that uh, over the years, it has, or I would say decades, it hasn't been really changed, but most recently, um, through education and awareness and knowledge from the diaspora, I think that has broken it down to uh, maybe a couple percentage, but we don't have a strong data um, right now. I think the Edna survey that was conducted in uh, 2006 to 2009, I believe, was uh, admitted patients for over the years, I, I believe, uh, maybe about 3,700. 3, and of that 3,700, there was about 97% um, of Somali patients have gone through FGM. The recent survey that was conducted um, has shown a decrease. It's not released yet. And I think that um, through educating the midwives and them being skilled and trained and armed like ready-to-go troops, I think they are the one that are making the difference because uh, communities, uh, rural communities are the ones that are relying on them and they trust them than an outsider coming in and telling them, you know, this is how it should be done. So I think there has been success in that. Um, and I think the UN has done a, a tremendous work in spreading, um, spreading the issue of FGM. And in terms of gender-based violence, you know, we've, uh, it's, it's, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, uh, post-war there's rape um, and all that. But I, I think culturally it's a thing that it's always going to be um, something that we're going to tackle on. Um, we're focusing specifically on um, the training of midwives. Uh, we believe that right now that's what we're going to handle and the um, elimination of the F uh, female genital mutilation, also known as cutting, is one area and I think um, we're getting support from local NGOs, uh, NGOs uh, like Fistula Foundation to help us uh, with, the tra uh, with training at UNFPA. I think they're doing a lot for Edna Advin Hospital um, and I guess, you know, it's an ongoing battle, but um, you know, over time, I think education does wonders. And I and I think uh, just another thing I wanted to add into was the you know you mentioned the uh, the Mediterranean crisis coming coming out. There's also uh, this is not related to the hospital, but also to, to just let everyone know that there's um, folks from Yemen coming to Somalia. I don't know if you heard to Somaliland. Uh, from fleeing from the civil war, so I, I think uh, I think there is an issue with if they can be able to uh, you know take care of the um, the refugees coming in. And initially, it was a controversy about them coming in because you know um, the ability to take care of them was an issue. And I think it's an ongoing issue. So it was actually both are coming south as well. So just wanted to keep that on everyone's radar. It's very interesting. I actually have no idea about that. Um, people from Yemen coming to Somalia. Then, yeah. Um, so we have one more question. That is a general question. I think both of you can speak to, uh, which is about the tools and um, so what tools and technology can help us improve the situation of sexual and reproductive health uh, during disasters and crisis situations. Uh, if we want to um, start with Phil for that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, family planning is, is a huge issue, um, even, even in emergencies. Again, I'm not an expert on um, reproductive health, but I, I can give this a go. I think, um, you know, making sure that um, all the, the FP needs that... Um, we had before an emergency are are provided, and I think um, my colleague, who we unfortunately lost, would be able to talk about this um, in Nepal, and she sort of alluded to it. But um, having sanitary napkins, having simple things that um, that you know are probably not on people's minds when an earthquake happens, um, but are still obviously necessary, um, are things that that shouldn't be overlooked. So. 
you know, obviously uh, in an emergency response, nothing is, is done perfectly. Um, things are, are very chaotic. And so, um, you know, but I think every time that we respond, uh, we get better. So um, not excluding things like um, family planning and reproductive health tools and technologies, I think, is, is pivotal. Um, so it's, it's an imperfect science, but I think um, we're getting better each time. And um, it's something that I think we'll, we'll definitely be striving to, to do better uh, on in the future. But um, again, I, I think maybe my, my colleague, um, Rukia, can, can do a better job answering that question. I would say the number one, number one pri priority in our in our sense in terms of um, safe birth kits, midwifery kits, um, not only training the midwives. I think number one is uh, providing them the tools such as midwifery kits. So when they're going out there, they need to be packed and armed and ready to go. Like, um, so I think the uh, midwifery kits are on on um, in, in terms of providing. Um, skilled attendants, you have to actually give them the tools. So, uh, you know, and it, it, it's, it comes in, um, you know, we are, we are uh, working in it. The things that comes in would be gauze, gloves, scissors, so safe sanitary uh, uh, way of delivering a child. So I think number one would be for us as simple as tools, and they're really not expensive, very cheap, a couple of dollars uh, would provide that for a midwife. Thank you so much um, for, for those responses. And we've talked a lot today about um, the importance of empowering a local response and the importance of empowering uh, midwives and health workers and those who are on the ground directly responding to a crisis or a disaster. But what is, what is the role of um, local and national governments in response? Um, they play, I, I think, a vital role. Um, but I'm interested to hear from both of you um, what you think their role is and how they um, should respond in, in these situations. Um, Phil, we can start with you. Yeah, I can just speak to um, my experience in Liberia. I mean, you're not going to get anything done to put it bluntly, without uh, the government on board. So um, they will allow you in. They can also kick you out. Um, you want to treat them as partners. Um, so they will often call for international assistance. So in the case of Liberia, in the case of Nepal, both countries did. Um, sometimes they uh, think that they can, can do it uh, on their own. Um, but it really is something that is done usually in partnership with um, with the UN, with uh, uh, NGOs like Save the Children, um, with local NGOs who, who may know the context um, even better than some of the, the INGOs. So, but the, the national governments um, play a huge, huge role. I mean, they're they're the ones that um, you know know where where the need is greatest. I mean, um, INGOs like Save the Children can do what are called needs assessments and. And get in there, but but um, but oftentimes it's working with with key ministries, the Ministry of Health, um, the Ministry of, of Gender. Um, those are the people that that we talk to um, on, a, on an almost daily basis. They're involved in the cluster meetings. Um, so no, we obviously need their their support. We need their help. We need their their guidance um, to tell us, you know, where can we be best served to to help. Um, we had a very positive experience with the, the government of Liberia. Um, so we were able to, um, to accomplish what we needed to accomplish, but it was definitely something that was done um, in partnership. And I think that's the key word to, to take away from this conversation. Um, no one sector can do this alone when there's an emergency. Um, so the, the national government and the local government, um, along with um, international partners is the only way to get the job done. I would say uh, for us it's, um, it's bottom up. Uh, we would, uh, the, it starts off a lot with clan leaders, um, tribal leaders local, on the local level. Um, the national, international um, political uh, government bodies are the ones that are actually really important and not just happens in New York or Geneva or DC it also happens not only in Hargeisa but in the local level so I would say 
um, working with the local community and, and, and coming up with the needs um, and addressing those, but also with support, obviously, from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, uh, and and most importantly, I would say for Edna Hospital, they have they they wouldn't be where they are with without their partners. So um, Direct Relief, UNFPA, um, Fistula Foundation, and and other local uh, uh, organization has been providing them with tremendous support. Um, and in terms of sustaining it, it's it's basically it's between the government and the hospital having a planned out. Um, an executed way, and not just the hospital, but the uh, but the city and the region, um, making sure the health systems are are fully and adequately uh, prepared. Great, thank you so much. I think both of you touched on the key point, and that's really partnerships, whether with local government, hospitals, um, those other organizations who are working on the ground as well as such. Uh, such a key and vital thing to empowering women and children in um, crisis situations. So I think both of you all um, touched on that, which is really, really great. Um, we're coming near to the end of our time together, and it's been such a robust uh, conversation. But I just want to uh, ask you all a final question, and that's, you know, when an international crisis occurs or a war, a war breaks out or a natural disaster happens, uh, everyone in the international community around the world wants to do something to help. Um, you know, even our uh, readers want to know what they can do to help. So I'm wondering if each of you can share um, three ways that someone can be uh, really involved and help empower women and children affected by these situations. Rukia, um, we can start with you. I would say number one uh, would be, if you can, go. Go there. Um, it, it would also inspire you, as it did for me. Um, I went for the first time in 2011, and, and, and then I uh, started the foundation uh, two years later. Um, so I, I would say going to an actual country, you can do so much. Um, number two would be, I would say, to support our training uh, midwifery program, anything you could do to spread the news. Um, Go out to your local communities, friends, family, tell them about the wonderful work and the impact training a midwife can do for the region. Um, and, and the third thing I would say is um, just basically, uh, I would say, I, I would say donate. Donate to the Edna Athen Hospital Foundation so we can reach our goal of training 1,000 midwives. That would be tremendous. Phil, can you also speak to that? Yeah, I think we have um, similar priorities, um, Rakia and myself. Um, actually, the first thing that I would say would be to donate. Um, so a lot of people, and they're very well-intentioned, want to send water, and they want to send food, and they want to... So with, with an emergency, you can imagine the first 48 to 72 hours are absolutely critical. Um, we need to have uh, the ability to get food and get water and get shelter um, to the to the beneficiaries right away. Um, shipping those things from America or Europe or wherever, um, we just we just won't be able to to respond as quickly as we want to. But if we're able to activate quickly through mechanisms that we've set up, and a lot of this comes from from money from individuals. Um, and it's very easy. You go to savethechildren.org, and and we're still raising money for for Nepal and other emergencies. It really does make a difference. I would say the second thing is to if you don't have the the means to donate, please raise awareness. I mean, anyone um, can send a tweet. Anyone can write a Facebook post. Um, anyone can tell can can put pressure on their um, political representative, saying you know we need more support for um, X Y Z countries. Um, a lot of times, you know, if, if politicians are not hearing those things from their constituencies, why are they going to then um, lobby those those uh, government donors to, to release more, to more funding for those emergencies? So I think that's something that should not be overlooked. Everyone has a voice, and um, the power is in numbers. I'd say the third thing is um, 
to really just pay attention, I think, to, to read about the things that are happening. I mean, I don't know how many people know about what is happening in Burundi. They just had elections. I mean, here's something that um, could really get out of control. Everyone rem remembers the Rwanda genocide. I mean, here's something. This is a country that has been going through so much in the last couple of months, and I don't think it's on anyone's radars. And I think, you know, just being an informed citizen and understanding that um, even those disasters that don't make CNN, um, people are still suffering. So um, the Syria crisis is a really good example. I mean, that's been going on for four or five years at this point. I can't, I, I, I can't even keep track. And, um, you know, not much has changed, unfortunately. And so here's something that this used to be a middle income country. And I, I, people are fleeing Syria if they haven't already, um, you know, by the thousands. And it's, it's an intractable crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's something that um, we really need to to get a handle on and I think here's something where advocacy really plays a, a huge role um, making sure that um, that this leader in Syria um, knows that the international community is watching that we haven't forgotten that we're keeping the fight on um, is something that's going to turn the tide on Syria and I think that should be a lesson for other emergencies thank you so much that's um uh, great for our readers and everyone who's watching to know um, specific ways that they can help and and get involved. And I think um, both of you touched on staying informed. You know, r talking about it with friends, uh, writing whatever it is that you're passionate about. Um, you can do it from where you are and um, staying up to date on on the issues. So I think. Um, that's great. I want to give you all um, just maybe uh, another minute if uh, either of you have any final reflections on our conversation today, um, things that you uh, weren't able to share. Um, just give you a minute to, to share um, before we end our conversation. So Rikia, we'll go to you. Uh, Rukia, you're muted. Yeah, Rukia. Uh, sorry, everybody hears a lot of bad news, and you know it's always on. A, it's always good to leave on a good note. So I would say, um, you know, we Somaliland has made major strides in the in the f few short 24 years. The country has built faster than any other nation in that situation. Um, and I and I said I would say the hospital is a good example. If, if people go and see, um, you will be amazed by what's there and the level of security. And, and if you read the blogs from volunteers, you'll know it's not what it's, it, you know, it seemed. It's actually really, um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that you'll end up walking away proud of. It's a country that was totally leveled and it's now, you know, foreign markets are coming in. Um, you know, uh, and 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 education's coming up. You know, we ha I told you about the Dr. Shukri, Dr. Naima. You know, uh, uh, it wouldn't obviously help him with without folks like Dr. Edna Adan. That definitely made a difference. And I think um, uh, on a good note, we have uh, the Edna Hospital has trained about over 300, uh, no, 400 uh, nurses and midwives. Um, and I think uh, that says a lot in a few short years. Um, and we hope to continue that, you know, putting more health professionals on the ground. Um, it, it, it makes sense economically, and it makes sense um, in terms of gender inequality. It makes sense on gender-based violence, and it, it proves that once you empower a woman, it'll do so much. Um, and I think uh, educating and training midwives are, is one key example. Wow, thank you, Rikia. That's really inspiring. Uh, Phil? Yeah, so this conversation is, is so timely. Um, Save the Children comes out with a report every year, uh, the Tuesday before Mother's Day, called Stay the World's Mothers. Hopefully you've all have seen it. Um, not this year's Stay the World's Mothers, but last year's Stay the World's Mothers actually focused on this very topic. Um, a lot of the data is, is data that is, is very up to date, um, so it should still be current um, uh, even you know in 2015. So I really encourage you to go to savethechildren.org um, look for the Stay the World's Mothers um, 2014 edition. Um, learn about the, the 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 struggles that women and children have in emergency. I think it, we've touched on that 
it's one of those things that they are so at risk. Um, you know, it's it's something that that shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, their needs are so unique, um, and this report really sheds a light on on that topic. And so, I'm hoping that everyone um, takes a few, even if you only have time to read the executive summary, takes a few minutes to do that. Um, I think you can really learn a lot. I think you'll be really inspired um, to take action. I know I know I was when I um, launched the report um, last year. Um, it's just a really great read, and I think um, it, it, it's 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 good uh, material uh, ending this conversation. Thank you so much um, to both Phil and Urkia. Uh, I think this has been a great discussion today, and I just want encourage want to encourage those participating online um, to continue following GG Hangouts for more inspiring conversations. And I just want to thank our panelists today for for joining us. And um, to continue this conversation, I think we've just kind of touched um, on the cusp of, of what this conversation can be. And so I just want to encourage those uh, watching to, um, to take the advice of our panelists and get involved and to stay informed uh, on how you can help uh, women and children and, and girls in disaster and crisis situations. So thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.